Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm all right. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Got a cool setup here. Do you spend a lot of time in, in Toronto? I do. I live here. I got two kids here. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I thought you were down in L.A. I was. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. My mm -hmm. parents are both from here. Mm -hmm. My mom's actually a Montreal based, mm -hmm. and my father was from Toronto, and we came out here. Well, we, we come here every year for the film festival. Right. And I brought our sizzle. We made a sizzle called Working Moms. It was about eight minutes based on this concept I had when I returned to work too quickly and got postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And it was a comedy based on sort of the dark and light moments of working motherhood. And Sally Caddo over at the CBC took a look and said, I think you're moving here. Oh. And here I am. How's, how, how do you find the move? How, do you, how are you adjusting to your, at some ways, very natural and some ways very different Canadian life? Yeah. A couple months ago, I just loved it. I mean... Now I'm in the middle of winter going, <laughs> is it gray like this all the time? Like, I, I remember visiting here because we'd always come for high holidays and, rel you know, all my aunts, uncles, cousins are here. So we'd come and I'd go, oh, God, this city's so extraordinary. And if you just come for a weekend, it doesn't matter how gray it is. But when you live here day in and day out, I'm definitely feeling just the seasonal low of what such little sunlight can do. It'll get to you. Yeah. Yeah, it'll get to you. You mentioned earlier that you have two kids here. I do. In Toronto. Um, and I know you were working on this show, Working Moms, while you were pregnant with one of the kids. How close, and I'm sure this is a question you're getting all the time, but how close is the character you play, Kate, to to Catherine Reitman in real life? Um, A younger, more naive version of myself. You know, when I, I first wanted to go back to work, which, look, as an actress, you just want a job, right? Yeah. I mean, you're not going to be precious about when you go back to work. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to get a a job six weeks after my first pregnancy, my three-year-old, and who was then six weeks old. Um, and I just, I hit so much postpartum depression when I returned, and I remember just feeling just so heavy about it. And, but I also felt this like odd entitlement that I am allowed to go back to work. <laughs> I mean, it's something that, you know, my mother didn't raise me thinking, is that you have a kid and you usually make a sacrifice and most women I know feel really guilty about being a working parent. So I think the character Kate's approach to this is is how I felt in the beginning, which is, oh, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> I want a kid and I want a job. Right. I want everything. Mm -hmm. Why can't I have everything this extraordinary world has to offer? And of course you learn, as I have, that a lot of sacrifices have to be made in order to live that full life. Did you, did you learn things as, as Catherine Wright, me like, in making this show, did you learn things about your your, your own parenthood? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, like I'm a I'm a pretty flawed, selfish parent. Um, I love <laughs> the hell out of my kids, right? But I really love me, and I really love learning and doing things for myself and for my husband and continuing to grow. And that's something that. When I talk about my f with my friends, like in a private setting, they're like, oh, yeah, duh, the same. But when you're with like a mommy and me group, for instance, that's not really a concept that's so celebrated. You mentioned that you this started out as an eight-minute kind of sizzle, sizzle reel kind of like a uh, – I'm, I'm, I'm taking that to mean like a kind of an idea of what the show is going to be about, right? Like a little, a little synopsis of the show. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you really want to set the tone, like you know what kind of shows you like. Mm -hmm. You sort of – you grow accustomed to like, okay, this is the tone I want to see. And if you just write something, as so many writers have, it can easily get in the wrong network or wrong artist's hand or the wrong director, and all of a sudden it's a different show. Mm -hmm. And so by shooting a sizzle, it's a way of establishing a tone that you can manage. So take me back before that. When Take me back to the genesis of you saying, you know, I have a, I have a great idea. We should, we should make a show about working mothers. Cool. I was uh, crying my ass off. I was... <laughs> Where? In L.A.? Uh, yeah, I was in L.A. Yeah. And I was... Uh, you were off? What's off, that? You were off work at the time? I was at work. It was my first job back. Okay. Actually, my first job back was actually at Chelsea Lately. Mm -hmm. And um, my 10-day-old had a fever, and I left. And I had to pump in a green room. Same sound that you and I were just jamming to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was surrounded <laughs> by dudes, and I had a sweatshirt over me, like a zip-up sweatshirt, with it going underneath. And we were all writing jokes. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm probably going to die. This is... This is like a downward spiral of humanity, and I, I can't do this. And I said yes to a job six weeks afterwards that was in Philadelphia. And I was surrounded by dudes. It was my first Mother's Day that I was missing my child for. And people don't tell you this, but on, like, Facebook, on your first Mother's Day, people just, like, flood your wall with, like, Happy Mother's Day. Happy first Mother's Day. Yeah, Totally. Right. I understand. And yep. I, I didn't know. 
and I'm reading all these, you know, congratulations for being a mother. And of course, I wasn't with my child. And I'm with this group of guys, and a lot of them are SNL dudes. They're really funny, and they're just zinging me. And uh, I usually can zing back and take it and give it, and I just broke. Oh my. I just started crying, yeah. And it's, I got back to my hotel room, and I called my husband, and he said, you know, I think there's something here. It's painful right now, but I bet you a lot of other parents would identify with that. And so I started writing. I just wrote random scenes based on experiences I'd had as a working parent, and we shot it and cut it into about eight minutes. The 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 idea of what you said earlier about I kind of want to do it all. I love the hell out of my kids. You yeah. said, but I still want to have a career. I still want to feel feel fulfilled in that way. That's 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 nothing new in terms of what you see on TV. You don't see there's no shortage of commercials, especially in, in some television shows and some movies about people quote unquote, trying to have it all. Even yes. the idea of having it all has become a bit of a cliche now yes. in film and TV. What did you want to do differently in, in this work and mom show that maybe hadn't been touched on in other programs? Well, look, if you go after it that way, right? If you go after making a show that no one's ever seen before, yeah. I think that's actually thinking very broadly, in my opinion, for writing. What helps me is if I just base my stories on things that have happened to me, things that feel authentic to me. So, each character, Jenny, Kate, Anne, and Frankie, all of them, the cornerstones of who they are, whether it be vanity or selfishness or whatever it is, is based off of moments that I've had as a mother where I felt that I couldn't candidly speak about it. And that awkwardness and that pain is where the comedy comes for me. It's funny, you know, the creatively you mentioned that because I've been thinking a lot about that these days, that it's so much easier when you make something to think about what I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. But it's actually so much more effective to think about what you do want to do. Mm. You know, is that is that that that, that that's, that's 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 really amazing to think that way. But it's so it's so easy to go down a road of oh I, d- I don't want my show to be like that. I don't want my show to be like that. I don't want my show to be like that. And then you end up with a show that's kind of nothing. Totally. And I also think it's really easy to speak in critical thinking. I mean, sorry, in uh, critical analysis. So like, you know, I I was raised with two highly critical parents, and so if you think in that way, the fear takes over, and you actually can't do anything. A, good, and B, fun. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can sort of abandon that and just go, okay, I'm not afraid of failing. I just want to write something that feels really real to me. And even if it sucks, that's when all of a sudden, at least for me, my good stuff comes. Catherine Reitman, um, when you walked in here, we were we were kind of chatting and swearing. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I said to you was, and I'm, I don't know how this is going to work out for me, by the way, but I said, how did you get the CBC to let you make this show? Like this is this is there's like you know there's nudity, there's swearing, there's masturbation. It's not typically if I look historically at the television shows that the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation has produced, you don't typically find a lot of these things in them. Um, why was it? I, I'm not, I don't really want to get into like how the CBC got on with making this show, but why was it important to you to not not bend on any of those things? Uh, well, I will answer in that it, it wasn't very hard. Yeah. Uh, I have I had v- incredible timing, um, which is I got to meet Sally Cato at a moment where they wanted to make premium cable feeling programming. And they knew the sizzle. Like I said, I shot the sizzle so I mm-hmm. could manage that tone and make sure they knew exactly what I wanted to make. This wasn't a broad comedy. Um, and once they saw it, Sally said, let's make it. But this isn't also like – this isn't some kind of Stepford mom – No. Like you said, mom group kind of show – there's there's the 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 bumps and the and the bruises yeah. and the and the blood and the guts in this. Why was that so important for you to show? Well, look, that's the kind of show I like. I like shows that feel premium. I like shows that aren't afraid to show the, you know, the sort of snarled nail. I, w- I want to see the pain, and I think if you can earn that, if it feels real, if you're experiencing the pain with a character, then you're probably more likely going to laugh, and that laugh is going to feel so much more rewarding. I. I I got I love this story from the show. So the character you play, Kate, successful PR executive, she got pregnant at the peak of her career. She's returning to work after maternity leave. I, that, that's quite a scene, hey, in the first like ten minutes of the show, where she goes, "Yeah, well, I got I got pregnant when at, at the peak." You can't imagine how weird it is to get pregnant at the peak of your game. Yeah, and then yeah. The, and the other gentleman in the office is like, "Well, no, nothing keep me out of here except for a fire." And yeah. You hate that guy. There's a scene at the end of the second episode when Kate is trying to breastfeed her son at home. And this is an amazing story. You say it was actually happening in real life and in real time for you. We just we just have a clip right here. Oh, great. Wow. Yes, let's give this whole thing a little whack, huh? Yeah, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Please. Please. 
Oh, no, it's all right, buddy. Oh, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank you, Charlie. That's Catherine Reitman from the television show Working Mom. So is, is this true? This That wasn't a, a written scene in the show? Um, sorry. It was, uh, it was... It's, it was just a crazy, you know, I, I spoke to you a moment ago about timing. The timing of my life in the last two years has been just, it, it, someone wants me to make this show, someone up there, <laughs> because everything seemed, the timing-wise of it all was just really serendipitous and wild. Uh, I did, I, I got pregnant the day before I sold this series, and my pregnancy was through the writer's room, and when we got to this particular scene, um, about 48 hours later, earlier, excuse me, my son decided to stop latching on. And I think that's because, um, and to any mom listening who's experienced this, I so feel you, stress is not a conducive environment to make good premium breast milk. And I was so stressed out. The one thing I kept saying is, yeah, I'm going to be gone 18 hours a day. I'm not going to see my son, but God damn it, I'm going to breastfeed. I'm going to pump. I'm going to make milk. And that's how I'm going to contribute to my child's life. And my body was like, "Uh, no, you're not. (laughs) <laughs> you're exhausted and stressed out and I'm not going to make anything. And so my milk stopped. My baby started crying. And two days after that is when that scene was going to shoot. Now, I have twin boys, uh, Mason and Nolan, who played my, my son Charlie on the show. For whatever reason, this happens sometimes. Even with twins, they weren't available to shoot that moment. Okay. My baby Liam, who was only three months old at the time, happened to be visiting on set. Oh, yeah, your, your baby. My actual real-life Catherine Reitman baby. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, so that crying, it made me so emotional because that's actually Liam crying. It's actually Liam in that scene. And so I went to breastfeed him thinking, you're going to get gold here because he's not going to latch on and he's going to torture me and go crazy and it'll be this great scene. It'll feel so potent. And he latched on. <laughs> in the middle of the scene and the ending of, the, that, of that episode now is a win which is the baby latches on in that moment of me going, oh, my God, thank you so much. Oh, my God. That gratitude, that relief is completely real. That's, that's beautiful. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with Catherine Reitman about, I guess, art imitating life in, yeah. your, in your new show, uh, Working Moms on CBC. That's a heavy thing you just told me. That's a heavy story. That's a, a real-life problem that a lot of people don't, don't think about, you know, stress and being uh, unable to produce milk. But not just that, but... Feeling the need to contribute when sometimes you feel like your hands are tied. There's postpartum depression on this show. There's suicide. There's there's slut shaming. Um, unwanted pregnancies. This show is, though, really funny. <laughs> it is, and I it, that those those two things don't seem to to link up, but but they are. So how do you how do you tell these serious stories? And that's that that's an interesting line. If you, if you can't see me right now, I'm drawing kind of a line. He's on the doing table. a really good job. One, uh, this is all I can draw, by the way. One line, right there. That well, it's a help one. I can draw that and a cowboy smoking cigarettes. That's what I can do. <laughs> so, the line is: if you treat it too seriously, then it's, then the, the humor doesn't come out. It's not a funny show. If you treat it too lightly, then those those serious topics are treated lightly. Like, how do you balance that line? You just have to be truth to it. It has to be honest. Um, I think the step one is writing. Step two is hiring a cast that really respects the material and honors that moment in that character's life. And then, of course, the direction of it and cutting of it and the music you apply to it. I mean, I guess there's several steps to it. But um, for us, you know, look, personally, I've always dealt with moments of pain through laughter. Mm -hmm. I'm the chick that's laughing at a funeral, not because I disrespect the dead, because I don't know how to process pain. I've always needed to laugh or find something bizarre about it and, and, and laugh through it. It gives, me, it gives me relief and it gives me a way of thinking about it in an objective way. Um, so there was no question that dealing with postpartum for me personally, the best way to deal with it was to be able to write something really funny and true about it. Um, and everything else that you mentioned, those are all real life topics of, you know, just the struggle, you know, someone once described to me that being a working parent is like having a rubber band inside of you. And the further you get away from your kid, the tighter that band gets. Right. And at some point that band breaks, but it's always trying to keep enough give that you can get through each day. When you, okay, go ahead. That's it. When you, when you, when you, when you first, when you first walked in here, you, you told me a little bit about how you feel like this character, Kate, is, is, is kind of true to life. Yes. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of like you. And as I mentioned in the introduction, you have uh, all these other credits under your belt and either writing or acting. Does this role seem to have more heft? Like, does this role, do you feel more responsibility in this role? Not just that you're created the show, but also that you're kind of playing a version of yourself. 
playing a version of myself, I don't feel any responsibility because that comes quite easily to me, right? Yeah. But I feel uh, so much responsibility in the show and that I'm representing a good amount of working women. And there aren't a lot of shows out there about working mothers. I mean, some of the criticism I've got on the show are that I'm not representing enough women, mm -hmm. which only speaks to me about how much we need to have a conversation about how there should be more shows about working mothers so more people can be represented. Right. There was some criticism of the show in the press a little bit about that it was only um, portraying one slice of working parents, upper right. class uh, uh, you know, working parents who could afford nannies. Yep. And, uh, you, and you've read some of that. Oh, of course. Look, and it, it breaks my heart because the last thing I was trying to do was exclude any working mother or only represent one kind of working mother. Um, I just wanted to tell stories that I knew. And these four characters are based off of, you know, they're extensions of me. And do I want to explore more demographics and more incomes, everything in season two? You bet. If, I, if I'm given that luxury, you bet. But what I, the responsibility I felt was to tell the story of these four women uh, and with dignity and with honesty, and that's what I attempted to do. I hope, you know, I hope people can relate to them. But, you know, I was thinking about that criticism because I think that um, in, in this case, you know, you, you make the show Working Moms featuring mainly women in, in leading roles uh, in, in upper-class situations, and you, get, and you get criticized for only portraying one, one class. I mean, Lena Dunham makes girls. She's, uh, again, another television show featuring mainly women. She gets criticized for uh, portraying inaccurately or only portraying one aspect of mm. kind of Williamsburg hipster life. Do, do you find that making a show like this opens you up to different criticism that, say, male creators and male actors don't get? You know, is there a double standard? You bet, of course. Uh, and, you know, whether that's about upper middle class working women or not, I think that, you know, I was just concerned about, you know, I'm telling the story of forget what their demographic is. These are four highly flawed moms. And I absolutely believe that there is a different lens held on mothers than any other women. I mean, it forget even in television and film, just on social media, the amount of judgment that we receive for doing the best job, the worst job. I mean, you're in, you're on a constant microscope mm -hmm. of how you are as a parent and as a human being. I, I got to ask this question. Uh, your your dad's a legend, Ivan Reitman. I mean, he's he's one of the most acclaimed directors and producers of all time. I understand. So I was thinking that if you were if you were if anyone was making a, a television show or a movie and he shows up on set. Like there'd be a little bit of oh god, I better I got better watch what I'm doing here now. Or I feel a lot of pressure. Not only do you got that, but you got his dad too. And I know he showed up on set. How'd you deal with it? Um, it's funny. It's you know because of course my father has this you know he has this like well of knowledge and wisdom because he's been doing this a hell of a lot longer than me, and I would be a fool not to heed his advice. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, and of course that came into play, but. I'm also making a show about working moms. Mm -hmm. I'm also representing a lot of really contemporary ideas that he, although he understands, you know, it's not really of his time. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was a, a balancing act of him always going, hey, do this and me being like, you're absolutely right. I can't, you know. And then there's moments of, you know what, I don't really understand it. It's not for me, but I get it and good for you. Yeah. So there was both sides of it. And also, no one on the planet knows the hours of production better than my dad. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I think people thought he would show up and it would just be this like really cool movie star experience. But in fact, like he, out of all my friends who visited, was the one guy who didn't complain about the catering, who like, <laughs> you know, knew knew what it was to shoot in like a tiny house and like with a tiny stairwell because we're yeah. all in location, no, no studio. So he, there was this great thing where I felt like I had this comrade in some ways because he totally knows what it is to shoot it. 16 to 18 hours a day, have crap food, no air conditioning, and just have to sparkle all the time, you know? And, and, and were there moments where you were like, all right, now, I, Dad, I got it. I got it. Of I don't, course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. I think there was a sound guy listening because at one point he was like, you know what I would do? And I was like, Dad, I love you. You got to get out of here. <laughs> and he was like, I totally get it. I love you. Um, but it all comes from a place of love. I mean, there's so much respect, mutual respect, actually. It's just... Also, I'm trying to carve this thing out for myself. Yeah, you know, I, I got to yeah. learn. I got to learn the lessons on my own. Yeah, yeah, it's hard, man. Because I, I, I bet he wants to help. Of course. Yeah. Of course, he's very protective of me, and he wants. He doesn't want me to make the similar mistakes he's had. He also has this great view. You know, as I've been watching, just the numbers come in and all this. He's seen so many successes and so many failures. Right. Mm -hmm. He's had the whole roller coaster ride of his career, and I've gotten to watch 
how he takes it, how he handles it, how he digests it. And he's just, he's such a pro. Mm -hmm. he, he maintains such a steady to him. And that's something I really admire. How's he doing? Is he doing all right? He's doing great. Yeah, he's doing all right? Yeah. Oh, God love him. Tell him hello. I will. Um, how will you know if you've been, um, I guess to conclude, like you make this show, I know you, you said like, please God, if you get a season two, you'll be able to tell more stories. But like thinking even like larger than that, I know you want to entertain people. I know you want to make people laugh. But like, how will you know deep in your heart whether you're successful making the show or not? What does that mean to you? I already know. I already know because there are women, you know, God bless Twitter, I guess, but there's women reaching out to me saying, hey, thanks for talking about postpartum or, hey, thanks for talking about how hard breastfeeding is or thank you for telling the story of being a mom. You know, when I found out how well we did after the first week, I locked myself in a bathroom stall and I just cried because <laughs> while like my husband and all these guys were celebrating, I like hid out because it's just amazing to know that a story about four moms mm -hmm. would garner this much attention that people would want to watch it. And do you have these people in mind when you're writing it, when you're making it? I, th you know, I think about them when I'm shooting it. When I'm writing it, I can only think about the character. I, I try to stay really okay. yeah. individual, but of course when I'm shooting it, I'm going, okay, how do I represent women? How, because I know I have a, um, a BS factor. If I'm watching something and I'm like, no, that's not real. That's not how moms are. So of course that's, you know, that, that radar is on all the time for me. Catherine Reitman, it's been so much fun to talk to you. You too, thank I'm, you. I had a great time. Me too.